Thank you, Bobby, for that beautiful testimony of um, the, our Heavenly Father's provision, care, and um, compassion for His people. It's good to be celebrating Mother's Day with all of you. And we, so whether you're a biological mom, a spiritual mom, an adoptive mom, or if you're doing a mothering of any kind, uh, know that we all love you. And we're, I, I hope that you will enjoy the extra attention and the treat from your loved ones. Now, for some of you whose family is not around, know that your church family appreciates you too. And I pray that you will especially have a strong sense of God's love and favor embracing you today. Now, it's good to be reminded that God paid the greatest tribute to a mother's love when he used it to illustrate his tender and comforting love for Israel. In Isaiah 66, 13, God says, As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. So God knew that his love would be better understood by his people if he described it in terms of a mother's love. And so as a way to celebrate our mothers and in honor of God who gave them to us, I'd like to invite you on a journey as we revisit a mother whose story is recorded for us in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and chapter 2 until verse 11. And her name is Hannah. I'm sure her story is something that you and your children and grandchildren, if they go to Sunday school, they know it very well. I know that many of you too uh, know someone named Hannah. I know four friends whose name is Hannah. And that's how well-loved Hannah of the Old Testament is. Hannah's story is also personal to me, and I'll tell you why in a bit. So Hannah was a significant uh, figure in the history of God's people. She lived during the transition from the time of the judges to the monarchy, and she was the mother of Samuel, a prophet, and the last judge of Israel. Samuel also functioned as a priest and anointed the first two kings of Israel. But then Hannah's story is more than just an account of her trusting faith and exuberant joy in the Lord. It shines a light on the trustworthy God who's sovereign over both individuals and nations. So yes, we will look at the events in Hannah's life, but we will keep an eye on God as he superintends circumstances in line with his purposes for Hannah and his people. So let's look at Hannah's world. Now Hannah and her family lived during one of the darkest moments in the history of God's people. They lived during the time of the judges. This was a 300 to 400 period, uh, year period that began after the death of Joshua and until the time of Samuel. Now, scholars date this around 1100 BC or some 3,000 years ago. Ancient, yes, but it is a powerful story. And yes, we think of Judges as a, both a period in history and also as a book in the Bible. And you find the book of Judges as a sequel to the book of Joshua, which we're doing in our sermon series. You see, after Moses and Joshua, there was no leader that unified the tribes of Israel. So they attempted to possess the uncon still unconquered lands but there was great turmoil and they were easily oppressed by their enemies. There was also this great apostasy as the people rebelled and engaged in widespread idolatry. So there was this cycle of rebel uh, rebellion. God disciplined them through oppression from enemies and then they would cry out to God. God would raise up a judge, not in the sense that we know judges today. Uh, the judge then were more like military leaders sent by God to deliver them from their enemies. And then there's going to be a time of peace that would ensue and then after that they would again 
reject God. So it was a downward spiral. And Judges 20 verse 25 sums it up for us. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So this is the culture where Elkanah and Hannah lived. But they were to be God's instruments in the story of redemption that threads through the history of God's people and the whole Bible. So let's look at their story. Verse 1, with its accompanying genealogy, tells us that Elkanah was an Ephraimite. Now scholars say that uh, he was from Ephraimite, so by residence, he was from there, but his family line descended from Levi. He was a Levi by birth. We know this because Elkanah and Hannah were parents to Samuel, and uh, as I mentioned, he's the last judge of Israel who functioned as a priest, and by God's instructions, priests are to come from the tribe of Levi. So that was just to establish the credentials of uh, Samuel. Verse 2 tells us of a family situation. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah. The name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. You know, God's design for one is for one husband and one wife in a marriage. Genesis 2, 18 until 23 tells us that a husband is supposed to leave his parents in order to hold fast and be united to his wife, to one wife. Now, during this dark period in Israel's history, polygamy was common, not just among the surrounding nations, but sadly also among God's chosen people. So we find polygamy first recorded in uh, Genesis 4.19 and in Deuteronomy 21.15.17, we see that though it was not endorsed, it was regulated. But still, polygamy was never God's intention. The fact that Elkanah, a Levite, would have two wives indicate a big departure from God's expressed will. Now today, some men, men, this is not a sermon uh, directed at you, but I'm just stating facts, but there are some men who justify having more than one wife by conveniently pointing to scriptures like this, like David, Solomon, who had 700 wives, 300, sorry, 300 wives, and 700, balik tadiata, 700 wives, 300 concubines, and 1,000 mothers-in-law. You know? <laughs> but, you know, that is a defective application of the word. We must know that while all of the Bible, that all that the Bible records is true, not everything that the Bible records, God endorses. So the, what we have here is descriptive. It describes to us what happened, but it is not prescriptive. So God does not endorse the practice. But you know what is true? Uh, well, if you have questions, uh, young men, men, um, go ask Pastor Larry and Pastor BJ. And my husband agrees with me. You know, but what is true is that even in those days, the pain it brings to families is undeniable. It's the same today. Dads, moms, the children, the church, they're negatively impacted when we depart from God's design of one husband for one wife. But you see, there's a big picture here. Hannah found herself with a challenging set of circumstances, but what Hannah did not know is that the Lord was again about to act on behalf of his people. You know, one of the foundational truths of the Christian faith is the sovereignty of God. And so when we talk of sovereignty, we think of supreme power and authority. The Bible testifies to God as one who is in control of his universe and determines the outcome of all things. He has absolute authority and rule over his creation. 
He controls and guides all events for his glory and for our good. Romans 8, 28. And so, you see, it's a comforting truth, especially when we are facing trials in life. Now, in Hannah's case, uh, God determined that she was now at the right place. She was at the right time, at the exact set of circumstances, so she can be a channel of blessing to her family, to her people, and to all of us. But Hannah did not know that yet. And so here's one truth that's helpful as we look at our own set of circumstances today. God orchestrates our lives according to his purpose and will. God orchestrates our lives according to his purpose and will. Do you believe this? Is God absolutely sovereign in your life? Or is he simply partially sovereign? Now, some of us may resent the fact that we are where God has purposed us to be. Maybe because by all measure, you're thinking that you are in a hard place. Like Hannah, you're probably experiencing pain that won't seem to go away. Perhaps there's a wayward husband, a rebellious child, a place of shame, scandalous family circumstances, great losses, deep and persistent grief, long illness, yours or that of a loved one, and you find yourself asking the what, the why, and the how. What's the point? Why me? How long? But here is the big truth about your and my world that I hope will steer hope in us. God is sovereign over the lives of individuals and nations, and he orders the circumstances of our lives according to his purpose and will. So if you belong to Christ, if we belong to Christ, we are God's children, and we can be confident that we don't exist at random. Our reality, our world, will never spin out of control because our God is sovereign and He is purposefully governing your life and mine. So, Hannah is a real person. She had problems just like us women and mothers today. So let's look at Hannah's woes. Now, verse 3 establishes for us the high degree of God awareness this family had. They were worshipers, and year by year, they will travel to Shiloh, where the Ark of the Covenant was, in obedience to God's requirements. So Elkanah and family made their pilgrimage, and this could mean that they visited three times for the required feasts, or perhaps he visited three times, and for that and there was that one time that he brought his family along in all of those visits. Now, there was also the mention of two sons of Eli, whom the Bible describes as evil or wicked men. And so what we find here is a contrast that's hinted at. We have a godly or God-worshipping family versus the God-rejecting family of, of all people the priests at Shiloh. So this again was another indication of how bad things were in those days. Now yet even in a god washing family, problems happen much like in our families today. So verse 4 says, On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. So Elkanah was not timid about his love and preference for Hannah. Now some scholars think that Hannah must be the first and the loved wife because but because she was barren, it seems that Elkanah must have been pressured by the prevailing culture. 
that says that children are necessary to ensure continuity of family line and that the more offspring, the more help there is for the man. They're mostly a farming and herding community. Now, children, in addition, symbolize status and wealth. And so you can imagine how Penina must have felt as the unloved wife that no matter how many children she bore, she was never going to be the object of Elkanah's affections. No wonder why she was very mean towards Hannah. Now, Hannah's pain is understandable. Her husband, though he loved her, has another wife who bore him children because she was barren. In, other, in, in her particular world, infertility was a source of shame as people often associated it with God's displeasure. It was a curse because uh, God told them to multiply and the promise to Abraham was uh, people as plenty as the sands on the seashore. So it was a social embarrassment to her husband. And her husband, if, he's chose, if he so chooses, may divorce her and would not be considered in the wrong. You know, I guess more painful than the fact that she can't have children is the reality that it was God who closed her womb. In verses 5 and 6, twice it was stated in our text that the Lord had closed her womb. So ultimately, she did not have children because the sovereign God withheld it from her. That must be a very painful truth to bear. Today, it's the same thing. We have children because the Lord allowed us to have children. We do not have physical children because the Lord has another plan for our lives. And so, Hannah was loved by her husband, though she was barren, and Penina took every opportunity to bully her. So, verse 6 says, And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up, she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? So Penina provoked Hannah every time they would make the pilgrimage to worship. So can you imagine being intentionally mocked for your failure or your lack at just about the time when you're supposed to be worshiping? That's stress to the nth degree. So Hannah was hurting and weeping and would not eat every time this happens. Elkanah would then try to comfort Hannah with his love. You know, what a noble and admirable husband. I'm not complaining, my husband is a good husband. But you see, in a world where women were generally seen as pleasure givers and child bearers, and where their identity was closely linked to a husband or to the head of the household, their father, Alcana treasured her. He did not care whether Hannah was barren or not. He loved her anyway. But Hannah's pain continued. She wanted to have children, and God was not allowing her. Now, this might seem like a self-absorbed desire, yet you and I know that it was God's plan for her to bear children all along, and it will happen at the right time. Still, Hannah had to endure insult and provocation from the rival wife, it's noteworthy, though, that Hannah, whose name means grace, displayed that grace. She did not respond with anger and violence. There were no fighting words, no drama. She simply wept and did not eat. 
So God allowed Hannah to experience his pain for a season in order to prepare her to trust him for her needs. And here's the wonder of God. He repeatedly made everyday events work for his purposes. And this includes all the hurtful and difficult circumstances of life. And here's another truth to ponder. God uses pain to help us rely on him. God uses pain to help us rely on him. You see, pain and suffering is a common experience, and it's something we often avoid in this pain-averse generation. And sometimes we moms tend to shield our children from too much troubles. We fight their battles for them. But you see, ordained by our Heavenly Father, pain is a gift. It's part of life. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. You know, we don't long for God when we are comfortable and when things are in place. But when there's pain, our longing for God and our prayers become more clear, they're more honest, they're deeper, more fervent. With pain, our shallowness fades and authentic desires are expressed. So, where is your pain taking you? Does it lead you to God? God is sovereign and He is good. His intentions are good, and He always does what is right. So God is purposeful in our pain and suffering. If we invite Him, if we invite Him, He will show up in our brokenness. So will you allow Him to come alongside you in your struggles? God is trustworthy, and he can be trusted with our pain and suffering, and even if at times that suffering is self-inflicted. God will not always change our circumstances, but he will always provide the enabling to endure. God is good. He uses pain to help us rely on him. And Hannah is such a great example for us. Her faith remains strong despite the private and public pain and shame she suffered. She never went ballistic. She endured personal suffering. And she went to worship the Lord in her pain. So let's look at her worship. And so in uh, 1 Samuel verses, um, chapter 1, verse 9, until chapter 2, verse 11, the first thing that we see is her worshiping through her heartfelt and bitter lament before God. Now, yes, lament can be worship, especially when we come to God in humility instead of a grumbling spirit. So while they were in the temple and after a meal, Hannah took the opportunity to go directly to God for her troubles. Verse 10 says she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. So Hannah went to God, to Yahweh, to Israel's God, and wept and poured out before him all the bitterness, the distresses, and the pain that was inside of her. Hannah knew where to go, to the one who had the power to close wombs and to the one who had power to let her bear a child. You know that we know so much more about Yahweh than Hannah? We know we can access God anytime because the Spirit is in us. We know that the promised seed, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, has come and he intercedes for us. We know we do not need to be at a certain place to pray. Unlike our shaky Wi-Fi connections, we can always connect with God with no issues if we truly seek him. How we need to level up 
our desire and longing for God, especially our longing for fellowship and to connect with Him in worship. We need to be like Hannah. So Hannah knew that at the temple, Yahweh will hear her. Hannah knew that the Lord God is the all-powerful maker of heaven and earth, the sovereign God who makes the barren woman fruitful. She knew that Sarah, who waited 25 years, uh, finally had her son. And she knew about Rebecca, who took time to have a child. She knew that Rachel, Jacob's wife, was also barren for some time. Hannah had faith that God would grant her request. And so she made a vow before God that if God would give her a son, she will offer him back to the Lord. Now, in those days, they made vows, but were strictly commanded to honor their vows. Today, we let our yes be yes and our no be no, because we can't keep vows. And the Lord Jesus knows that. And in those days, women's vows can be nullified by their husbands. But Elkanah upheld her vows. So it's a testimony to Elkanah's great trust in his wife. Now, Hannah promised to dedicate her son back in what is known as a Nazarite vow for life. Now, this Nazarite, Nazarite vow is a vow of dedication which was voluntarily done by the individual in those days, generally to set them apart for a task or to show gratefulness to God, and it's only for a season. But in this case, Hannah made a vow on behalf of her unborn child. Now, the only other uh, persons who did that in scripture would be Samson's parents. So the vow included not touching dead bodies, not taking strong drinks, and no razor upon their hair. So that was a bold promise to make before God. Now, Hannah's demeanor at the temple caught the attention of Eli, the priest, because Hannah's intense prayers were inaudible. Her mouth was moving. She was not saying anything. Now, this kind of prayer was the first of its kind recorded in scriptures. And Eli mistook her for being drunk and tried to send her away. Now, this could have been a regular experience for Eli. There might be those who uh, took some, uh, a lot of drinks and they would uh, uh, wander into the temple. Or it could be a sad indication that the priest was no longer spiritually discerning and sensitive to authentic worship. And so, again, a reflection of the times. So, Hannah had to explain herself to the priest, and immediately the priest blessed her. Eli said, go, in verse 17, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made for him. You know, this blessing brought so much assurance and comfort to Hannah, and Hannah's disposition was drastically altered. Hannah was comforted even before she got her prayer answered. Going to God to lament her situation was sufficient for she knew that God heard her. Has this ever happened to you? Just praying to God already changed your whole perspective and attitude. Now, Hannah's posture of humble lament helped me. My daughter, Joanna, she's somewhere here, left home 12 years ago, she got married, and the circumstances were beyond painful. She was pregnant before that marriage, something we discovered two days before we were to fly to another country for ministry. Now that the world crumbled for me is an understatement, and I blamed myself for not protecting my daughter enough. So I lamented long and hard before God. That was a long season of weeping and praying for me and my husband. It's, it was like that. all the tears that I cried during my growing up years were concentrated in that period of time. 
But then God's comfort came, and as we trusted Him, He sent friends, the church, our leaders to come alongside us. It was timely and sufficient. It was from God. So we were enabled to love and bless our daughter no matter what. And the Lord, our compassionate God, steered our daughter's heart to repentance. Now today, we can only praise God that my daughter married a good husband in Allen. And they have a lovely daughter, my granddaughter, Louise, whom my daughter encouraged to serve the church early. Now, your struggle may be different from mine, but have you experienced that kind of praying where you pour your heart out before God, pour before Him your sadness, your frustration, your pain, your anger, your bitterness? You know, go to God and experience for yourself his goodness. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And don't just take my word for it, but go and trust and know the peace that can come in the midst of your storm. And so in due time, Hannah received the gift. Verses 19 and 20 says, they rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah, And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. Now the Lord remembered Hannah, not in the sense that he forgot Hannah, but that the right time had come for God to act in Hannah's favor and in Israel's favor. So Hannah's prayer was spot on. It was so aligned to God's will and purpose. She asked at the right time, and God granted her request. And you know, Hannah's subsequent act of faith was nothing short of remarkable. She prepared her son to offer him back to God, and when he was wind enough to be left at the temple, she brought him there. You know what's really hard for me to imagine that is the fact that I had a hard time. Shortly after my daughter left home, my 27-year-old son then left for the land of the anime. He went there to do further studies. There he eventually found a good job, a lovely wife, Ayaka, who loves the Lord. And now they have a three-year-old son named Luke. But when Mark left, I was into another season of grieving because I knew I will see him less and less. I miss him much, but things are different. It's never easy to let go. But imagine Hannah. She left a three-year-old boy in the temple as she promised God. And you know, that's hard. The priesthood then was corrupt. Eli's sons were predators. They were sexually immoral. And sure, I was thinking Mrs. Eli would probably help, but she didn't have a good track record. So it didn't seem like Hannah was leaving Samuel at a place of safety. But you know what? Hannah trusted God. And God loved Hannah and Samuel. God protected the little boy. He was raised in the temple Hannah loved her son and was content with at least the yearly visits and making a child-sized robe that would make Samuel look like a cute little servant in the house of God. We read that in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. You know, Samuel turned out very well. He was a blessing to his people He anointed Saul, and then David, David was Israel's greatest king. It was no small matter to do that, because King David foreshadowed the king of kings, the Lord Jesus, who would come from 
David's royal line of descendants. So moms, what this story tells us is that our kids do not belong to us. They will be with us for a season, and that season is an opportunity that God gives us to train our child to love, honor, and obey, and enjoy God. And then we offer them back to God. We let them go. So, and I guess this is true for us Filipinos, resist the temptation to cling to our 35-year-old children. <laughs> yes, it's time to let go of that 40-year-old baby, especially <laughs> if they have their own family already. So when Hannah brought Samuel to the temple together with a generous offer of gifts to God, she did so with a grateful and joy-filled heart. As her little son worshipped, she was overwhelmed with joy and offered her worship through her prayer of praise to the God who looked on her with favor. So what you find in chapter 2, verses 1 to 11 of Samuel is a most remarkable prayer of triumph. It's a song of thanksgiving and transcended Hannah's time and circumstances. Hannah responded with joy over God's sovereign dealings with her people in the past and his graciousness in rescuing her from the shame and stigma of infertility. The Holy Spirit used her words so that she sang a song of praise that prophesied not only God's imminent work to be accomplished in her and her son's lifetime and that of King David, but where her words also referenced the Messiah and how God exalted him. So verses 1 and 2, chapter 2, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. So Hannah rejoiced in the sovereign and holy Lord for rescuing her from shame from the shame of barrenness, and from the scorn of the one who looked down on her. Then in verses 3 to 5, I really recommend that you go back to this song um, in your own time. She warned the proud because God knows all things and all motives. She then continued to praise God for his attributes, his holiness, his uniqueness, and for the strength and safety that he gives because he was their rock. In verses 6 to 8, she praised God's sovereignty in ordaining reversals in life. The mighty warriors are defeated and those who stumble are strengthened. Those who are full now work for food. Those who are hungry are hungry no more. The barren bear children. Those with children wastes away. The Lord gives life and death. The Lord raises up the poor and sets them to reign. Now he can do all these things because he is the sovereign God. Verses 9 and 10. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. So Hannah sings to the Lord as the keeper and enabler of his people and as the judge of all. Now in what scholars refer to as a prophetic utterance, she mentioned God giving strength to his king at the time when there was no king as of yet. So it referenced an immediate fulfillment in King David and in a much distant future to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Anointed One, the Lord Jesus Himself. You know, King David in 2 Samuel 22 echoed, echoed Hannah's prayer 
to God and Jesus' mother, Mary, likewise used Hannah's words to offer her praises to God after an angel announced that she will be the bearer of the Messiah. Now, Mary's song is known as the Magnificat, My Soul Magnifies the Lord, and Hannah's is referred, it's referred to as the Magnificat of the Old Testament. So you see, God took Hannah's praise beyond her time in order to honor the true king, the Lord Jesus, who is God from eternity, and who would enter Hannah's world 1,000 years after her time in order to accomplish salvation of sinners. So what a privilege the sovereign God gave this mother for her outstanding trust in God. And you know, in her lifetime, God continued to bless Hannah because she bore three more sons and two daughters, and her son Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. You can read about that in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 21. And here's another truth for us. God honors prayer of trust and worship beyond our expectations and more than we deserve. God honors prayers of trust and worship beyond our expectations and more than we deserve. So let this be an encouragement to us. Our sincere and trusting prayers and our humble worship of God matter. God, the all-powerful and sovereign one, can lift our prayers in alignment to his will and for the blessing of his people in ways beyond what we imagine or think. So what sustains you in difficult times? Where do you find your greatest joy? Hannah's ultimate fulfillment was not in her husband, not in her children, but in the sovereign God, the Lord Jesus. The God of Hannah is the same God we have today. Our God today is not an improvement of Hannah's God. They are one and the same. And that God is the Lord Jesus. He governs the lives of individuals and nations. He ordains life circumstances for our good. He will make our prayers soar. He is the sovereign God, and we can fully trust him. Let's pray. You are sovereign in all your ways. And so forgive us, Lord, if we think any less of you. And so I pray, Father, that today life choices will be different, perspectives will be higher, that our way, ways of doing things will be more aligned to yours because we are trusting in you, our sovereign Lord. And Lord, I pray for some of the, for the mothers and those who do motherhood in our midst, that if they're celebrating, allow them to celebrate with meaning because you have ordained their steps. For those of us who are struggling in some kind of pain, Lord, come alongside them. Reveal to them your tender and compassionate care and that you are purposeful in their pain. And for those of us who, are, who, who might be wondering what it means to relate to the God of Hannah, Lord, reveal yourself to us as the Lord Jesus Christ, the only qualified Savior from sin. I pray, Lord, that they will surrender their life to you and express their faith in determining to live for your glory as they leave their life of sin behind. And for this I ask in the matchless name of the only Savior, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.